Welcome to Global Perspectives. Many people find the Persian Gulf perplexing. Not Gregory Gauss, the head of international affairs at the Bush School at Texas A&M University. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Dr. Gauss. Thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about the Bush School and your program within it, just to help us understand. Uh, the Bush School of uh, Government and Public Service at Texas A&M was established with the Presidential Library, President George H.W. Bush's Presidential Library is on campus and as part of the deal that brought the library to campus, we also established a, a school of government and public service. We have about 350 students in the school, all of them getting master's degrees, uh, no undergraduates, no PhDs. Uh, it's a pre-professional program. Two departments, we give out a master's degree in public administration. We call it public service and administration to emphasize the service element. And my department gives out a master's degrees in, inter in international affairs. So it's very much geared toward President Bush's vision of creating educated public servants, the next generation. And President, uh, former President Bush had a significant interest in, in, in the Middle East and was at the forefront of the second biggest period of peacemaking we've seen there in, in modern times. Certainly. Uh, t tell us about how his vision affects your program uh, more, in more detail. Well, he, uh, he did have a vision of, of nonpartisan, well-educated public servants. Uh, the, his, his mantra was, uh, public service is a noble calling, and we have that plastered all over the school everywhere. So we're trying to, to create an atmosphere in which our students learn the techniques of public management, they learn the historical background of areas of the world in which the United States is engaged, and they're ready to serve Republicans and Democrats, that they're, that they're a nonpartisan resource for good public policy. And obviously, it, there's a broad array of topics that the school explores, but your main interest, your specialty is the Middle East, and you've picked the Persian Gulf within that. The International Relations of the Persian Gulf, I right. believe, is one of, one of your books. As we said at the beginning, the Persian Gulf is one of those areas that people are fascinated by, but they also find it perplexing and, and, and troubling at times. And it seems that every decade there's something that brings us back to the Persian Gulf, mm -hmm. you know, starting with the revolution in Iran in, in the 70s, and then we had the Iran-Iraq War, and then Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, and then the United States invades Iraq, and, and now we've got ISIS. Uh, right. on multiple fronts around, around the Persian Gulf. Why is it that, first of all, conflict seems to be a permanent feature of the region, and why is it that it keeps bringing our attention back um, every so often? Well, I think the attention part is easy to explain. Uh, the Persian Gulf is still the world's oil patch, even with the technological changes that have brought American oil production back up to historic levels of the past. The Persian Gulf region, the, the, the countries of the Persian Gulf, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, and Oman, still account for probably about a, maybe a third of world oil production, roughly, and still account for about 50% of all the world's known oil reserves. So this is the oil patch, and, and that's why the rest of the world really cares about, about the Persian Gulf. Now, I don't know if we can associate oil with conflict, but uh, at least we can talk about the relationship. Uh, I think the Iranian Revolution, which really drew a lot of attention to the region uh, originally back in 1979, didn't have much to do with oil, but it had to do with the uneven development that occurred within Iran as a result of enormous oil money coming in with the oil revolution of the early 1970s. And so that's not inevitable. Saudi Arabia hasn't had a revolution, and it's had even more oil money per capita than, than Iran. But the relationship between oil and social change, I think, is very interesting. Then Saddam Hussein attacks Iran in 1980. I think that that, that had more to do with the revolution itself. Saddam, a secular, Baathist, Arab nationalist regime, was threatened by this notion of, of, uh, uh, of a regional rise in Islamist politics. Uh, 
But Saddam's invasion of Kuwait in 1990, I think, was more directly about grabbing a piece of, of Kuwait to, to get more oil to sustain his regime. So our invasion of Iraq in 2003, I don't think had much directly to do with oil in that I don't think the United States was after uh, uh, taking the oil, so to speak. Uh, I think this was more about a post-9-11 assessment of the kinds of changes you needed to have in the Middle East in order to prevent another 9-11 from happening. I think it was a misdiagnosis of what 9-11 was and, and why it happened. But I think that that was why the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, targeted Iraq. Uh, but we wouldn't have been able to fight that war unless we had had the military infrastructure that we had built up in the Gulf region since the first Gulf War of 1990-91. And the reason we fought that war, the United States fought that war, was oil. Right? We did not want one person, Saddam Hussein, to control so much of the world's oil resources. And that's why we built the military infrastructure of bases that we have in the Persian Gulf region. And without that infrastructure, I don't think we could have fought the war in, in 2003. So war and conflict are, are connected in an interesting way in that part of the world. There, there are still some analysts who say they are surprised by Saddam Hussein's original decision to invade Kuwait. Mm -hmm. Is that something we should be surprised about all these years later? Well, it was unprecedented in terms of Arab politics. Uh, there were Arab regimes that sent troops into other Arab states, usually with the permission of the, of the other government. This was the first time that one Arab state invaded and absorbed another Arab state. And, and that was, in the modern history of the Arab world, unprecedented. And I think that that's why it caught so many people by surprise. Uh, in retrospect, of course, anything that happens seems inevitable. Uh, but at the time, it, it was quite the surprise to, uh, certainly to our government, and I think to the governments of the region itself, uh, the Egyptians, the Saudis. They thought that they had a negotiating path for Saddam Hussein and the Kuwaitis. And Saddam let them think that. I think, in a, I think we have some evidence now that he did that deliberately to try to, to uh, obtain tactical surprise for the invasion, and he did. But uh, in light of the fact that Iraq had just concluded the war with Iran, it, it, it seemed like the timing of this was unusual, especially if, as, as things turned out, it wasn't in Iraq's favor. No. Uh, I think that Saddam Hussein saw a number of things happening at the end of the Iran-Iraq war that made him worry about the stability of his own regime. So he, came, he comes out of the Iran-Iraq war, which was eight years long, probably 100,000 dead or more on the Iraqi side, enormous lost opportunities in terms of the oil money that was, was spent on the war and that wasn't produced because of the war. So he had a, he had a population that you know, was not seeing the the benefits of victory, so to speak. At that time, oil prices were relatively low in the late 80s. Uh, and he, he blamed the Saudis and the Kuwaitis for production decisions that he said kept the price of oil low. On the international front, you had the collapse of the Soviet, pro-Soviet regimes in Eastern Europe. And we know from, from the record that Saddam was quite worried about that because he saw his regime, which was aligned with the Soviet Union, as being very similar to many of those Eastern European uh, communist governments that had collapsed in 1989. So I think that he thought that things were really moving against him on a number of levels, on the international level, on the domestic level, on the oil level. And that if he didn't shake things up, if he allowed events to continue to move in that direction, that his regime would be in real, real trouble. I think that that's why he took this extremely risky move to grab onto Kuwait, which would make him richer, give him some leverage, and he hoped to turn, turn the course of events around. A after the war was over, there was a tremendous opportunity for peacemaking. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those extraordinary moments in history when the senior leadership of the United States was aligned with the senior leadership of the Soviet Union, and they co-sponsored the Madrid Conference right. and so forth. But, but there was also, in my mind, something that, that hasn't perhaps been weighed as much in the conversation, which is the personal friendship between former President George 
H.W. Bush and Mikhail Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. and, and I've talked to Gorbachev about this relationship and, and how it's, it's a friendship that has spanned decades and that he never visits the United States without saying hello to his friend, mm -hmm. uh, the former president. Uh, how much of that was a factor in the peacemaking efforts that followed? I think it certainly played a, a role in putting together the Madrid conference. Uh, I think Gorbachev and, and President Bush were, were not that friendly when the Gulf War happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, but I think the experience of that conflict somewhat brought them together. But by the time you convened the Madrid conference in the summer of 1991, it was really President Gorbachev's last major mm -hmm. international event because the Soviet Union would cease to exist a couple of months later. Uh, and so I, I, I do think that it was enormously important for the, for the players in the region, for the Syrians, for the PLO, for the Israelis, to see that there was no daylight between the Soviet Union and the United States that they couldn't play the superpower game that they'd been playing for, for decades, that the, that the Americans and the Soviets were on the same page. Then the Soviet Union falls apart, and it really becomes uh, an era of uh, American dominance. A and that had some positive impacts on the Arab-Israeli peace process. Uh, I think that the Syrians thought that they had no option, that they had to move with the peace process. But it also, in the long run, had some negative impacts, too, in that uh, I think we in the United States developed a sense of hubris about what we could do in the Middle East, that without any external challenge, we could perhaps remake the politics of the region. I think that manifested itself most obviously in the war against Iraq in 2003, uh, where we thought it would be relatively easy to reshape the domestic politics of an Arab state. But I also think that it, it to some extent, uh, affected the peacemaking efforts of the Clinton administration at the end of President Clinton's term. He came very close to brokering a Syrian-Israeli deal, close but not as close on the Palestinian side. But I think there was this sense that uh, we had time on our side. And if we didn't do it this year, we could do it next year or the mm -hmm. year after. And in fact, what we had at the end of the uh, of the 1990s and in 2000, President Clinton's term, we had a window that was shutting. And we had to, we had to get the, those peace deals through that window before uh, the events that would uh, consume the 2000s, the 9-11 attacks, the Iraq war. And, and it's a shame that President Clinton uh, didn't understand how unique that circumstance was and push harder. Mm -hmm. But there was also reluctance on the part of several of the participants, and including Yasser Arafat, sure. who seemed to have dug in his feet uh, toward the end of Clinton's term, which surprised a lot of people. I think that the Palestinians and the Israelis were not nearly as close as the Syrians and the Israelis were. I think the, the Syrians and the Israelis were 99 percent of the way there. Uh, and I, I fault President Clinton for not getting them that extra 1 percent. The Palestinians and the Israelis were, were further apart. And, and let's face it, there, there are thornier issues here. I mean, there's no equivalent of Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. Uh, I fault Arafat for, for one major uh, tactical error that became strategic. He thought that he could negotiate and fight at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so after Camp David, the failed Camp David talks in the summer of, of 2000, Arafat returned to the West Bank and Gaza. And uh, a new uprising began after uh, uh, then the head of the Likud party, Ariel Sharon, took a very controversial visit to the, to the, uh, the noble sanctuary, the Dome of the Rock area, the, the, uh, the Temple Mount. And that led to Palestinian rioting. And, and, and Arafat found that he could encourage that and continue to negotiate with Barak, the Israeli prime minister. He thought, I th my reading, he thought he was quite clever, but what he was doing was completely undercutting Barak's support in Israeli public opinion. And at the beginning of 2001, Barak had to face an election, and he was defeated by Sharon. Uh, by all accounts, Arafat was surprised that this happened, but he was the one who was basically undercutting Barak. I think the fault of Barak 
in all of this, both the Syrian track and the Palestinian track, is that he was all tactics and no strategy. Uh, he couldn't kind of fix on kind of an end result and say, okay, here's what we want and here's what we're willing to give. He was, he was kind of playing the tactical games and, and Clinton used to complain about this, mm -hmm. uh, about his dealings with Barack, that Barack was kind of leaving him hanging out. So I think that on both cases, both Arafat and Barack, there were serious tactical errors, although I think both of them basically wanted to get the, the deal done. They just failed. Do you mind if we play what if for a second? Sure. Uh, it's I one was, of my favorite games. I was one of my, uh, one of my personal perceptions regarding the 92 election was that I, I thought President Bush was going to win re-election. Mm -hmm. and, and there were many analysts who were saying that because of a variety of reasons, it was unlikely that a Democrat would be elected president in 92 or, or 96. Mm -hmm. they, they just didn't see that as a, a, and then Bill Clinton comes to the forefront. What, what if George H.W. Bush had been re-elected? Might the whole peace process and some of these other things we're talking about turned out differently, or do you think they would have followed the same course because of the other players? Right. It's a, that's a fascinating question. I, I think that the Bush team on foreign policy, uh, the President, Secretary of State Baker, National Security Advisor Scowcroft, were the best foreign policy team that the United States had had basically since the Truman administration. and. I think that they would have been able to grasp the significance, but also the fleeting nature of the breakthrough on the Palestinian-Israeli front that the Oslo talks represented, and might have been able to push more quickly toward a, a final settlement. Uh, the Israelis, particularly uh, Prime Minister Rabin, wanted a longer transition period. And in that long transition period, you had the assassination of Rabin, uh, the subsequent loss by labor headed by Shimon Peres, uh, the loss to Benjamin Netanyahu in the 96 elections. I'm not sure that any Ameri different American president would have changed that trajectory, but could the Bush administration have pushed Rabin for a much shorter transition period? Might we have gotten to final s uh, settlement issues? Uh, not in 2000. And early 2001, but in 1994, that would be, that would be the, the kind of alternative historical path that things might have gone. And then if Rabin had not been assassinated. Well, for, yeah, I, I actually think Rabin's assassination was, was probably the most important kind of historical turning point, because uh, Rabin clearly had the popular support within Israel to carry this through, whereas Perez, although, you know, he, Perez just died and he died lionized as a as a, one of the leading figures in Israeli politics. You have to remember, Perez never won an election as the head of the Labor Party. There was always a certain suspicion of him in the Israeli body politic. And Rabin probably would have been more successful at selling a policy and maybe would have won re-election at that election and could have handled the final, final status issues uh, sooner. Well, fast forward to today. The Persian Gulf is still a tinderbox, sure. and in fact, we seem to have more issues there than, than ever before. A lot of them driven by nationalism, I would imagine, and some other participants. But do you think that it's likely that there's going to be conflict there between uh, a pair of nations, whether it's Saudi Arabia and Iran or, or some other mix? Or do you think a lot of that is just noise because they're trying to define where they are in this post-Arab Spring environment and, and um, how their relative strength plays out in the region? I think one of the problems in the, in the region as a whole is that there's not enough nationalism and there's way too much sectarian feeling. There's way too much identification with either uh, big identities like Sunni Islam, Shia Islam, mm. or smaller identities, right? My tribe, my town, my party, my sectarian group, my ethnic group. Uh, and what we're seeing is the collapse of centralized authority, right? We're seeing it in Syria, we're seeing it in Iraq, we're seeing it in Yemen. Lebanon hasn't had it since the Civil War of the 70s. Uh, further afield, we see it in Libya, 
uh, the creation of these political vacuums, of these civil wars, just sucks in the regional parties, right? Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and the international parties, Israel, or, uh, the United States. Israel's really stayed out of these, mostly. But the United States and Russia, uh, these political vacuums just invite external intervention. And I think that a lot of the, uh, of the, the tensions in the region right now uh, are a result of the fact that these civil wars are going on and drawing in the outside powers. Uh, now, having said that, there's no easy solution, you know, end the civil wars, build strong states in these places. That, that, we don't have a formula for that. We tried that in Iraq and we failed. Uh, so just because you can diagnose the problem doesn't mean that you have a, a, a good, a, a good uh, you know, set of ideas for how to solve it. But I think that that's where a lot of the tension comes. Uh, there's a strong sense of nationalism in Iran, you know, different from the Arabs, you know, united by centuries of history as a, as a, a unified state, uh, defined by a different language and a, and a rich culture, you know, written, oral, pictorial, uh, artistic. Uh, the Iranians have a, a strong sense of nationalism, but there's also this revolutionary element that dates back to 1979, where many people in Iran, including at the top levels of government, feel that they have a political message that should spread to other countries as well. Uh, and this export of the revolution makes its neighbors, including Saudi Arabia, extremely nervous. If Saudi Arabia had a stronger sense of nationalism, perhaps its Shia minority uh, would would uh, see the Saudi government as being more representative of it, and more importantly, maybe the Saudi government would not be as suspicious of its Shia minority. So I, I actually think a little bit more nationalism might not be the worst thing in the world. Do you think conflict is inevitable between two or more countries in the region, or do you think we will be able to navigate through that? You know, it's interesting that neither Iran nor Saudi Arabia, I think, wants to have a direct military conflict. The Iranians, who would have the upper hand in such a conflict, fear that that would bring in the United States, just like we came in when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1990. The Saudis, you know, much less populated than Iran, much smaller place, much weaker place in many ways, militarily. I don't think they want to have a direct military confrontation with Iran. So I don't think we're going to see uh, the kind of state versus state war that we saw when Saddam Hussein was was uh, causing the Iran-Iraq war, the invasion of Kuwait. But what we're going to continue to see is these proxy wars in these weak Arab states, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Iraq. We're, we're coming to the closing minutes of our conversation. You mentioned Russia. Could you just tell us in a few sentences what you perceive the, the Russian threat to be? It, it, the Russia seems to have stabilized Assad's hand to some extent in Syria. Now we're reading about significant Russian naval forces moving mm -hmm. into the Mediterranean, which has caused concern in many, many circles. What, what are your thoughts about Russia? I think the Russians want two things. One, they want to play the great power, even though uh, their material resources are vastly, uh, uh, vastly too small to sustain the kind of great power role that the Soviet Union had. The other thing that, that Putin worries about is Sunni jihadism, because he has plenty of Muslims within Russia itself. I think he wants to stop that in Syria so he doesn't see it spreading into Russia itself. And, and so, so we, we just, I guess, have to, have to wait and see. Um, do you have a subject for your next book? Just a little tidbit as we close. Yeah, I, I'm an administrator now, so I don't have as much time to write, which I'm sure you can appreciate. But uh, I'd like to write about Saudi Arabia. I'd like to write a book about how the Saudi regime has kept itself together for so long, because most people in the West kind of see this as an anachronism that's about to fall. Yet this regime has sustained itself for decades, and I don't see it going anywhere in the near term. So we'll look forward to that, and thank you for joining us today, Dr. Goss. It's been my pleasure. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.